somebody make the transition? If, if you're not here, raise your hand. No, we don't, we don't point it out. All right, if you have your Bibles, we will be in Acts chapter 16 this morning. But first of all, I want to read a passage from 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And reading some of these passages, I just want to ask you a question or a, or a thought. It's not actually a question for answering. It's just a thought that I had when I was studying this passage this weekend. Is how can people read the Bible and come up with the health and wealth doctrine? When you read any of the Bible, so much of the passages that... that are so long in the Bible and so prominent in so many places, I don't see how people can come up with some of the things they come up with. And the only answer is, is this, that's what they choose to see and that's what they choose to believe, regardless of what Scripture says. So in 1 Peter chapter 4, I want to begin reading in verse 12 and read 12 through 19. And Peter says this, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when His glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in having that name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if a righteous, if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Verse 19, so then let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. So the whole purpose of this passage that Peter's giving us is about suffering, about persecution, and about tribulation that's going to come into the Christian's life. And notice that he addresses this to Christians. But notice something else. When he talks about the suffering, notice that things like sickness, like disease, Things like food shortages, like high gas prices. Notice none of those things are mentioned. And things like that aren't mentioned because those are things that happens to the whole world. In other words, everybody goes through these things. Lost people, saved people, it doesn't matter. These things affect everybody. Now, while there may be some suffering involved in those things, suffering like high gas prices can cut into your trips to the lake. Amen? Amen. There's suffering that goes with it. It's not the kind of suffering that Peter's talking about. What Peter is talking about specifically is suffering persecution, suffering ridicule because of you're a Christian, because of the name of Jesus Christ. Now watch what he says in verse 14. There are two particular verses I want you to remember out of this passage. In verse 14 he says, If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So know this, when you are persecuted, when you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, it's not you that they are attacking. It is the Spirit of God. It is the glory of God that is in your life and on you. What did Peter say? He said, if you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. That's what they are attacking, not you personally. Now, yes, they are attacking you because you are the visible representation of of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit, but what they are actually attacking is the presence of God in your life. And then verse 13, notice what he says. He says, instead, when you're persecuted, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ. And here's the important part. He said, so that you may also rejoice with great joy 
when his glory is revealed. Now, the reason why I point that out is because that phrase, great joy, in that last sentence, great joy is actually two words in the Greek. So the thought is, is that you can rejoice when Christ is revealed at the rapture. You can rejoice with great joy, or you can rejoice with just joy. Just joy because you're there. You made it. Or you can rejoice with great joy. You can be excited about it. And he talks about this, or he makes a point like this in 2 Peter chapter 1. Down in verse 11, he says this, For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided to you. Now, most of us would just be happy just saying, okay, entrance into the kingdom of God is going to be provided to you. Hallelujah, I'm going to heaven. Amen? Amen. But Peter makes the point that it can also be richly provided to you. You see the difference? Great joy, richly, or I'm just happy to be here. It's that thing that I pointed out to you over and over in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bema Seat of Christ. John tells us that when Christ comes, some of us are going to shrink back in shame from his coming. Now notice he doesn't say some of us won't be there. Because we will be. If you're saved, you're going to be there. But even though you're there, you might shrink back from his coming. You might be a little bit ashamed to stand before him. And the reason that Peter gives it all points back to how you live this life, in particular, how you handle the persecution and the suffering that's going to come to a Christian because of the name of Jesus Christ. Now that, in Acts chapter 16, is why we find Paul and Silas suffering in prison. You know the story that we're going to read. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll kind of go over it quickly. They, they've come to Macedonia, and the first thing they did is they went out to the, to the river looking for people that were worshiping, and they ran into Lydia. You'll recall that from last week. They shared with Lydia. Lydia received the gospel. Then they begin to go through the town and they're preaching and teaching. And as they're going, this what the scripture calls a, a slave girl or a young girl that's demon possessed. She begins to follow them around everywhere they go. And, and she begins to, to talk about these men in verse 17 who are proclaiming to you a way of salvation are the servants of the most high God. Now, on one hand, I'm thinking, hey, she's telling the truth. You know, she's telling that they're the servants of Most High God and they're telling us the way of salvation. But then on the other hand, I think the reason that this annoyed Paul and caused him to react the way he did is they didn't need no demons and they certainly didn't need somebody that was caught up in the world of wickedness talking like this, even about them or about the Lord. And so Paul turned around to her and he commanded he, to the Spirit, he said, he commanded that he come out of her in the name of Jesus Christ, and the Spirit left her. Well, that upset some people because they were making a lot of money off of this girl, fortune telling and, and the prophesying, the things that she was doing. And so they took Paul and Silas, and, and the Bible says, we'll begin reading in verse 22, the crowd joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had severely flogged them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in stocks. So now not only have they been stripped and beaten without any medical care, they've been thrown into prison, the inner prison, and they've been chained. Why? Because they preached Jesus. For the name of Jesus Christ. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Where were they? In church? At a revival meeting and everybody's excited and having a good time? They're in prison. In the inner prison. Beaten. Bleeding. 
without medical care. And suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. Paul called out in a loud voice, Don't harm yourself because we're all here. The jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and he escorted them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all his family were baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. So why was Paul and Silas suffering these things? For the name of Jesus Christ. They had been thrown into prison and beaten for the name of Jesus Christ. And what I want you to see this morning, what I want to talk about for a few minutes is this. The way that we endure the sufferings and the persecutions that we are going to face in this world. And if you're not facing them yet, you will face them. You're going to have to make a choice. That's God's word and that's God's promise. Eventually, we're going to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. And the way that we react to and endure these sufferings will determine the effectiveness of our witness. I've often said this. The way that we react is just as, if not more important, than the way that we act. Because, you see, we can act anyway. We can act as Christians on Sunday morning. We can act as Christians out in the world. But when we have to react to something... Often, when we have to react, it's not something we've had time to think about and plan. It's something that just happens. And the way that we react tells more about who we are and what we are than anything else. The way that we react. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 14, again it said, If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of the glory of God rests on you. The way that we need to act and react to these things is that way as the Spirit and the glory of God rest on us. We should be filled with the Holy Spirit at all times. We should be walking in the presence of the Lord all the time so that when something happens and we have to react, that's the way that we react in the way of the Lord, in the way of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to lose our reward, all of it or part of it, because of the way that we react. And we certainly don't want to see people reject the gospel of Jesus Christ and go to hell because of the way that we react. Now I want to give you two things real quick about persecution and suffering. And, and, and then we'll close. And I'll try to go through this as quick as I can. Two things. Number one, if we are going to follow Christ, we're going to have to deal with people. And the reason why that's important is because it's from people that the persecution and the suffering are going to come from. We're going to have to deal with them. I, I, I wanted to, to say this to make a point, and I don't know how to say it because it, it's kind of crude. But, but it, to me, it makes the point perfectly, and it's the way that people look at it. You remember in, in, in Forrest Gump, and then you used to see these bumper stickers on cars all the time, and, and it said, this particular word happens. <laughs> and, you know, that word started with an S and rhymed with, with hit. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something, folks. It don't happen. It don't just happen. People make it happen. If it weren't for people, there wouldn't be any. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. People. So if you're going to serve Christ, you're going to have to deal with people. If you're going to live in this world and name the name of Christ, you're going to have to deal with people. And you're going to have to deal with all kinds of people. Not just church people and not just 
good people because that's where the persecution comes from. If we're going to follow Christ, we're going to have to deal with people. And dealing with people, we need to remember something that, that Paul said. Paul said this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 through 2. He said, in addition, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the word of the Lord may be spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. So that's one side of dealing with people, sharing the gospel and people hearing the gospel and receiving it. But then he says in the next verse, he says this, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people because not all people have the faith. So Paul knew when he left to go share the gospel with all of these places that had never heard it, he was going to face two kinds of people. He was going to face people that was going to hear the gospel and receive it, and he was going to face people that weren't going to receive it. And some of them were going to be hostile to the gospel. When dealing with Satan, as in our passage, the girl that was possessed with the demon, notice that Paul cast it out. He was very stern. He was done with it. He attacked Satan, and it was over and done. But when dealing with the people, notice that they didn't fight back. The people that arrested them, the people that beat them, the people that put them in jail. They didn't fight back. They trusted God to take care of them in that situation. Just like Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 19. He said, so then let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing good. Now is that what Peter, is that what Paul did? That's exactly what he did. He knew when he went out that he was going to face this kind of thing. He was going to face persecution. He knew that when he went out, there were going to be people that opposed him. And he knew when he went out that he was going to trust God to handle those situations. And folks, that's the example that Jesus set for us on the cross. All through the suffering that he went through, the mock trials, the fake accusations, the beatings, the torture, and then the hanging on the cross. The Bible says there was never any guile in his mouth. He never rebuked. But what did he do? He prayed and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When we, when we serve Christ, we're going to have to deal with people. And the way that we react to those situations is going to be what affects the gospel that we claim to share with them. The second thing, when serving Christ, sometimes bad things happen. And the reason why I say that is because so much of this teaching that we hear today, I, I get the impression it's like this, oh, I'm going to serve Jesus and it's just going to be so wonderful and I'm going to witness and everybody's just going to love the gospel. <laughs> That's the impression I get. And that's what so many people think. Folks, that's not true. And that's not what the gospel presents to us. Paul told us it has been appointed to you not only to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but to suffer for his name. Now, granted, right now we live in a, a, a wonderful situation. And I've talked about this a million times. Thank God we live in East Texas. And thank God we live right here where we do, sheltered and protected. But one day it's coming. One day it's coming. Sometimes it's Satan that attacks us, as we see here with the Apostle Paul. Or, as we see with the Apostle Paul, sometimes it's arranged by God himself. What do you mean preacher? Yes sir. It's arranged by God himself. You remember. Just back in Acts chapter 16. And verse 1 through 10. Paul and them were planning on going in this direction. And preaching the gospel. And who told them no? The Lord did. So they went down the road. And they were going to go this way. The Lord said no. The next night. Who told them in a dream. To go to Macedonia and preach the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who led Moses and the children of Israel to the Red Sea? The Lord did. 
You see, there's only three reasons to go to prison, okay? One is as a missionary, one is as a criminal, and the third is because the Lord sent you there as a criminal. Even though they had done nothing wrong, they were treated as criminals and they were sent to prison and it was all because it was orchestrated by the Lord. Now think about that a minute. Why? Why would God let that happen to his servants, especially to the Apostle Paul? This is the apostle to the Gentiles, the greatest preacher possibly except for Jesus Christ to ever live, the greatest soul winner to ever live, and yet the Lord lets him be beaten and thrown into prison. Why? Because if it hadn't been for that, that jailer and his family and all of those other prisoners who were sitting there listening at midnight, they'd have never heard the gospel. And this jailer and his family would have probably never gotten saved. Now, is it because Paul and Silas went to prison? Yeah, partially. But more than that, it's because of the way that Paul and Silas reacted to being arrested, beaten, and put in prison. How would you have acted? What would have been your attitude at midnight? Don't say you'd been asleep. Not the way they were beaten. You wouldn't have been. You'd have been hurting. What would you have been doing? They were praying and singing to God. And I can't help but think that these hymns that they were singing, they had to be wonderful praise and worship hymns for these prisoners to be listening. Because if they were singing gloom and despair, agony on me, if they were singing I'm going to have to cross all these troubles and trials, I don't think anybody would have listened. But because they were singing victory in Jesus and oh how I love Jesus and oh what a wonderful Savior. People were setting up and listening to how can you guys be singing something like that? How can you be praying these, these wonderful prayers to a God that has left you here and abandoned you, beaten and bleeding and in chains? And Paul would say something like, because we serve the Lord God Almighty. Because we serve the greatest God there is. And it doesn't matter what happens to us. He is always watching over us and caring for us. And some prisoner said, yeah, right, look at you. And about that time, the walls begin to rattle. Amen. Yes. The floors begin to shake. Chains begin to fall off. And Paul, looked, I doubt if he did this, but he looked over and said, see, I told you. <laughs> Now, if he'd have been in there throwing a fit, moaning and crying, even if the earthquake happened, how was he going to witness to these people? If he'd have been in there screaming and yelling about his rights and he was innocent and I haven't done anything. And then God sent the earthquake. How's he going to witness to these people? But because of the way he reacted. All of these people got saved. So preacher, when they come for me, I'm just supposed to go quietly? Yes, sir. That's what scripture teaches. That's what Jesus did. That's what Paul did. That's what Peter did. They went. They reacted in such a way that every step of the way they could turn to somebody and say let me tell you about Jesus and they listened and notice notice what the jailer said now I know the Bible says that he woke up and when he realized what had happened he was going to kill himself but at some point he had to be listening to what was going on because what's his first words recorded what must I do to be saved why? Because of the way Paul and Silas reacted. Not because of the way they acted, because they were itinerant 
evangelists all over the place at this time. There were itinerant miracle workers. We read about one just a couple of chapters ago that, that Paul had to deal with, a guy named Bar-Jesus. They, they, they had this stuff all of the time. There were even people that cast out demons, and we're going to see that in, a, in another chapter or two. There were all kinds of stuff like that. And when Paul and them came through, that's probably normally the way that they were looked at. Just another sideshow. But when God allowed them, because he led them there for this purpose, to be beaten, arrested, and imprisoned, and they reacted with that knowledge, Look at what happened. Now, do you think that when Paul stands before the Lord Jesus Christ at the Bema seat, do you think he's going to be ashamed? I think he's going to have great joy. Great joy. Listen to what Peter says one more time. So then, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing good. So you're being persecuted. You entrust yourself to God and you keep on doing good. Even in prison. I don't want to go to prison, folks. I want the rapture to happen before all this comes down. But it doesn't even have to be about prison. It can just be in your everyday life at the grocery store. Somebody cut you off. Somebody's in the, the quick check lane with 40 items in the basket. <laughs> There's all kinds of ways. It's all about how we react to these situations that determine the effectiveness of our witness. Lord, Help us this morning, Father, first of all, help us to desire to witness, to share your gospel with those that you give us opportunity. And then secondly, Lord, help us to walk as in your spirit and covered with your glory that we may react in a way that brings glory and honor to you. Now, Lord, help us as we go into this quick time of business and just help us to follow the leadership of your Holy Spirit in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is our business meeting, and if some of you need to go or you don't want to stay,